So, welcome everybody. This is a really special occasion. Um, we're, we're today celebrating um, Nick Fletcher. This is the dissertation seminar. So, I'm going to start off with a few um, sentiments about Nick before he gets on to the, the real thing. Um, so, of course, when you think about working on mammals, you think of this amazing diversity we have in mammals, um, which is illustrated by this. Um, and then you think what Nick's working on. Uh, and he's working on um, what bird people call little, little brown jobs, LBJs. Uh, the, the LBJs are the mammal world, world of the bowls. Um, and you can see it's well camouflaged against the brown, brown background. Um, so poor old Nick, you know, all this amazing diversity of mammals, and, and it's my fault, you know, he ended up, and, ended up working on something um, like this. And he's been, I mean, one of the things I want to say about Nick is he's such a nice guy, and he's such a good sport, you know. So with this issue, he said, all the bowls are actually okay. <laughs> And more than that, I mean, this is really taking it a long way. He said, in fact, they're interesting because they're you know, This is really taking this view, of this, you know, take, taking the most uninteresting mammal you could possibly look at and actually say it's interesting because it's boring. So it's, and, and you'll see why I say that. If, from, from his talk, he has he has epitomised how to make the mo the best of a bad job. No, not really. <laughs> make, make the most out of this system and show show that actually the boringness is the most interesting thing. So look out for that in the talk. Uh, the other thing about Nick is he wears his flag. He's, he's half Swedish. And one of the reasons I think he wanted to work with me is because he saw a project that would actually happen in Sweden. And we thought that was going to happen for a long, long time, but unfortunately the Swedish part sort of didn't quite work. So he ended up having to change his flag. Um, but, he, but he never did. He never wore this particular flag. I, I don't wear it either, actually. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> Guy, such a good sport, he said, Britain is actually okay. You know? and he could have said, This is, you know, you, you have said, I, I'm going to do this PhD with you because I'm going to work in Sweden. But he could have walked away, but he actually said, um, Except. <laughs> um, and the issue is, um, some of the populations he's had to study. Um, are pretty unpronounceable. Um, so the island, like, like the Uists, north and south Uists, and you'd have thought this might be I lay, but it's actually pronounced I la. So uh, Nick's had to learn all that, and again, it's been an amazing sport and has, has, has done really well. But going back to the, bo the bowls, <laughs> he's, you know, he's carried on the uh, soul lab tradition of, of making lots of jokes. Um, so, but I'd like to be a, a bit more serious because uh, Nick has really been uh, a great success in his time time at Cornell and achieved a lot, and we're going to hear about the science he's, he's achieved. Um, and he's, uh, he's presented that work at many conferences, he's, uh, the papers are going really well, um, and he's been absolutely stellar in terms of getting grants. He's got grants from NSF and both the societies um, related to his work, the Society for the Study of Evolution and the American Society of Homology, He's also uh, had a Centre for Vertebrate Genomics Fellowship, so he's done, done really well. Um, so as well as that scientific thing, which he of course will be talking about um, a lot more, um, he's, uh, he's also a good citizen in, in many ways, and one of his passions is conservation, and there is a conservation angle to his work, and he will talk about that. But I'd like to call out both Nick and other um, EEB graduate students, and many of you won't know, they've actually set up a, a conservation genetics working group for the primary uh, conservation society in North America, and that's been very much an EEB Cornell-led thing, and, um, and that's very much to, to Nick's credit to, to do that. 
The other thing about um, Nick is he is just an amazing teacher. I mean, it's illustrated, I think, very well by this picture that uh, you can see all those students are, are relating to him and, and, and they absolutely do. If you ever see his feedback, it's just stunning. And he, uh, he has got two of the most prestigious um, awards on campus for teaching. And um, I'm, I'm really impressed with what, what he's achieved there. So, um, the other thing, he's been a great, great lab member and, you know, we, we will sincerely miss him. This is actually a photo of the, um, the last Christmas party where, uh, where the lab essentially won the, the trivia competition. <laughs> the lab that is, <laughs> except, except for me, um, I wasn't there, Ellen, who's at the, somewhere at the back there, she took over from me and so that's the reason why they won it because I thought it wasn't <laughs> Anyway, over to you, Nick. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming. It's really awesome to see everyone's faces smiling back at me, especially people that have traveled from very far, like my parents. Um, yeah, today I'm gonna to be talking about a couple of the projects I've been working on for my PhD. Um, and, and it's in my PhD I've looked at how uh, rapid divergence uh, in these cryptic world species were influenced by glacial cycling. And so a lot of evolutionary biology talks start with a slide like this which shows some dazzling array of uh, morphological and color diversity. And that's because people get interested in this kind of diversity and that leads them to ask questions about how and why this kind of diversity is created. But as Jeremy mentioned, and uh, as uh, a lot of you know, a lot of uh, species are actually cryptic. They're, they don't have this dazzling array of morphological diversity. They're actually hard to uh, distinguish from one another or they're drab and uh, you know, so-called boring. Um, and, but uh, I would argue and, uh, that cryptic diversity is actually very important. Um, and why is cryptic diversity important? Um, we can use an example from human health. Um, so these uh, are snakes in the genus Naja. These are cobras um, in uh, Southeast Asia and South Asia. And these are snakes that uh, kill some of the most people in the world through snake bites. And these researchers looked at uh, studies of the toxicology of these uh, venom of these, uh, of these snakes, and found that in these uh, studies, the study the effect of the venoms, fully about 75% of the, the studies that looked at them couldn't identify the, the snakes to the species level. And why that's important is that these snakes vary a lot, even though they don't vary very morphologically, so they're hard to tell apart, they vary a lot in their venom content and the amount of venom. And so, by not identifying them down to the species, it basically made these uh, studies you know, obsolete. They don't. They don't mean anything. You can't use them from one species to another. Okay. Another uh, example that I like is in kiwis in New Zealand, um, and these are you know charismatic and culturally important little critters. Um, and up till recently, they thought there were five species uh, in this group um, distributed on, on uh, the islands of New Zealand. But a recent study took a look at these a little more in depth and using genome-wide data found that there's actually cryptic diversity within these species. And so here's a, a species tree from SNP data supporting many, many more species. And then uh, these are structure plots, and each of the ro uh, rows in this case uh, is an individual. And the colors are the proportion of their genome that's assigned to one uh, population or another. And so when you see an individual like this, that means that there's admixture, there's gene flow between these two different populations. But when you have the single blocks of color, that means that there isn't gene flow, or there's restricted gene flow. And so within some of these uh, species groups, it looks like there's actually um, maybe a partial reproductive isolation between these. And why this matters is that you know, these are uh, uh, conservation, uh, of conservation concern. And so if you're doing something like a captive breeding program, and you can't under, uh, identify these species, it may be uh, not uh, very useful to try to you know, have different uh, groups that are uh, reproductively isolated try to reproduce in, in a captive breeding program. Another reason I like this, uh, this example is that they, they look to the past to try to figure out when these species diverged. And it seems like glacial cycling uh, had, a, had a role. So this is uh, uh, a map of New Zealand as it was during the last glacial maximum. 
And they think that um, things like ice sheets and rivers uh, were what initially uh, isolated these populations and caused them to emerge. And so this will become important later on. And so as Jerry mentioned, as, and as you might you know, guess from this, uh, this whole setup of this talk, I studied a, a, a cryptic uh, radiation of, of bulbs. Um, and they're all within the genus Microtus. And there's about 70 to 80 species, depending on what list you're looking at. But uh, this kind of summarizes the morphological diversity in the whole group. <laughs> I even had that kind of darker one right here. <laughs> um, but even though they're morphologically pretty hard to tell from one another, there's actually a lot of interesting biology that's uh, differentiated in this group. So a lot of interesting diversity in terms of their biology and ecology. So for example, there's some of the only examples of uh, monogamy in, uh, in mammals with the, the prairie bull. And they've actually become a, a lab model for studying pair bonding. Um, and, uh, but there's also polygonists and other um, mating systems as well. Um, they, they occur in a bunch of different habitats from the taiga to the tropics. So they experience a bunch of different ranges of habitats. They're predated upon about by just about everything. Uh, they are primary herbivores in a lot of the food webs that they occur in, and even you know little songbirds will predate on them. It's pretty amazing. Um, they become models for studying uh, co-infection in the wild, and so they're they're some of the best uh, studied um, species for studying um, multiple infections by multiple parasites. And there's also zoonotic diseases that are important as well. And they also have really just weird things going on, like XO, XY sex determination, where in the species of creeping bull in an organ, uh, males actually uh, pass on an inactivated X chromosome. So they actually don't pass on an X chromosome um, because their germ cells, the, the X chromosomes get inactivated, which is pretty wild and weird. And the, the crazy thing about this and all this biodiversity within these species that it all occurred in the last 2.2 million years. So 70 to 80 species, um, uh, all speciated within the last 2 million years. And this is based on a really robust fossil record. They have pretty uh, interesting and unique uh, molars, and you can pick that up in the fossil record, which is cool. So they have a really high speciation rate. And so a lot of people have speculated to what actually drives speciation in these bulls. And one of the reasons might be, or at least reinforcing this, these different species, is uh, karyotypic variation, which is the number of chromosomes uh, in these bulls. And so their diploid chromosome number uh, range is actually from 17 in that one that actually has an inactivated X chromosome, frequent bull, to 54. So this is the, the number of pairs of homologous chromosomes. And what we have here is a tree that's just picking kind of five random microtus species. And each of these little black dots or gray dots or white dots is either a fission or fusion of a chromosome that had to lead to the number of chromosomes that they have in each of those individuals. So there's a lot of variation in this group. They also have a very high substitution rate. So this is looking at mitochondrial substitution rates, and we have uh, synonymous substitution rates on the top lines and non-synonymous on the bottom. And uh, in both of these graphs, microtus is on the left, um, and this is comparing to a bunch of different mammal species, including things like chimpanzees, and this is actually looking just within rodents. And what you can see is that microtus consistently has a much, much higher uh, synonymous substitution rate, meaning that they're fixing a lot more mutations. Um, and finally, uh, one, th one of the things that I'm interested in is glacial cycles. So this is a, a map of the range of the, the genus. So it's got a whole arctic distribution in the whole new world. Um, and this is a map, this dark area, or the, the ice sheets during the last glacial maximum. And so you can see, just like the, just like the uh, kiwis we looked at in the very beginning, these, uh, these, this genus and all the species within it are heavily impacted by um, glacial cycles and probably isolated in different populations. And so I study the field bull, uh, Microtus aggressus, what was formerly known as Microtus aggressus. It's a polygonous species, it's active all year round. They have uh, four to six litters per year, and actually females become reproductively uh, mature at about 29 days of age, pretty well. Um, populations have, they show these distinct population cycling. 
So uh, this is showing ones that are about four to five years, but I have this little asterisk because the, the length of the cycling actually varies by latitude. So after seven years in the far north, then about one year, uh, basically seasonal uh, variation um, in the south. They have these really wild giant sex chromosomes. So these are, these are the chromosomes of a uh, female and a male bull, and they're all two scale. And this is the X chromosome and the Y. And so they actually predict that fully about 20% of the genome is found in these X and Y chromosomes, which is a uh, bit weird. <laughs> um, and also they, they've been, in one study, labeled the most, dietary, most important dietary part of more species of predator than perhaps any other mammal. <laughs> and this is basically because of their sheer <coughs> numerical abundance and the fact that they have a really big range. So, there are a lot of predators, and basically any predator within that range is gonna, and even not predators, uh, will eat the moles. So they're, they're important. Um, so what we know about the field ball already, and what people have proposed, is that there are actually three cryptic species within this group. And so this is the distribution of those three cryptic species in Western Europe. Basically there's the short-tailed vole, which occurs um, in the orange here, all the way to the eastern part of the range of Siberia. Uh, Mediterranean bowl, um, and then the Portuguese in the Iberian Peninsula. And previous genetic studies um, have shown that uh, a couple of things. One, that the, the Portuguese uh, field bowl split from the other two about 70,000 years ago, which is about the time of maximum glacial extent in the Iberian Peninsula. And the, the Mediterranean, the short tail, split about 25,000 years ago at the last glacial maximum. Also, at all the, the mitochondrial and nuclear markers that they looked at, there's reciprocal monophyly, which means that each of these cryptic species clusters with each other. These different colors are showing. And there's up to 6% mitochondrial divergence between these species. And so, what we wanted to look at in the first part of this is to see, we wanted to see how much human white differentiation there actually was between these cryptic species, and whether they actually differ in their eco, uh, ecologically as measured by their uh, environmental niche problem. And so what we did was we sampled 83 individuals um, from the Iberian Peninsula and Western European populations, representing individuals from all three different cryptic species. And we generated uh, genome-wide SNP data using genotyping by sequencing, which is a reduced representation approach that samples SNPs randomly across the genome. And we ended up with about 35,000 loci after SNP loci after filtering. And all this was aligned to the prairie mole genome, which is the closest reference genome. Um, and I'll just jump to some results. So this is a PC plot that reduces the multi-dimensional data of, of 35,000 SNPs into PC axes that um, are easier to digest in 2D. Um, and what we can see is that uh, they separate out these cryptic species, as you'd imagine, um, and that they cluster really tightly in these little corners. And about 40% of the variance in the data uh, separates out these, the, uh, the uh, Portuguese population from the other two, basically. And the other, and another 16% uh, of the data uh, separates out the Mediterranean from them. Um, and what I have in purple are pairwise average FST values between these different cryptic species. And as you might remember from population genetics way back when, if you take that, um, FST varies from zero to one, and zero would mean that these are completely panmictic populations. They're exchanging genes at a uh, low side. And one would mean that they're fixed, they have fixed mutations in, uh, in all areas of the genome. And so these are actually very, very, very high FST values. And it's useful to make comparisons to other uh, studies. And so what I did is I took some data from some friends from up here in the department, so um, some SNP data from uh, some red pole finches and uh, cichlids. Um, and I filtered them and um, got about the same amount of, uh, of uh, SNP loci and uh, looked, at, looked at these uh, different, different um, species. And what, what and oh, and the, and the key with this is that these are uh, species that have been named. So in the red poles, there's three different species represented in the PCA plot. And in the cichlids, there are uh, many species. And what you can see is there's very different patterns, and this reflects the different evolutionary um, uh, you know, kind of mechanisms that generate the patterns. So for the red poles, first off, there's much less of the um, uh, 
variation actually explains the divergence between these groups. And they have a, a ton of overlap. And that's pretty much the same with the cichlids. It's, there's a lot more overlap um, in these groups, and, um, and less of the variation explains this data. And that's because in the, what we think is going on with the red poles is that there's ongoing uh, integration and hybridization between them, and then selection out of few plumage genes. And in the cichlids, it's a very, very rapid radiation that's driven by really strong natural selection and a few uh, genes that encode either things that have to do with feeding or coloration as well. And so you can contrast that to the, the field bowl where it's actually uh, genome-wide divergence. So it's divergence at a lot of different loci all across the genome. And so we can look at this by looking at the distribution of SS FST um, across all our sites. And this, if you look at FST distributions, this is a really weird distribution because we have uh, fully about uh, you know, 12, 15, 13% of the SNPs are actually fixed in one population or the other. And you can look at this uh, along the oh, wrong computer. <laughs> along a chromosome as well. And uh, you can see that along, so this is just looking at chromosome one. Uh, and there, there's no pattern that I can see. But the one thing that is obvious is that there's strong uh, fixation across most of, the, most of the genome. So different than what you would expect in other groups. And so there are, we, we've shown that there's really high uh, genome-wide divergence. Uh, but what about their the ecology as well? So here are some uh, niche models that we um, generated for, the, for these bowls. And basically, it's a very simple model. The, it's an interaction between uh, temperature and uh, mean annual precipitation kind of uh, drives these models. And the, the short-tailed field bowl is in a relatively cooler and drier climate. And the Portuguese field bowl is in a warmer and uh, more humid climate. And then the Mediterranean is kind of boldly boxing right in the middle. Um, and so they, uh, we can also look at um, the, the amount of overlap we would expect between these different species based on their niche. And so the colors here, um, green, this light green is just where we, well, the whole area we looked at. Uh, orange represents very low overlap, and then red and dark green represent really high overlap. And so what you can see is that the Mediterranean and the short tail field bowl actually have some areas of low overlap predicted between their, their um, uh, niche models. Uh, but the Mediterranean and the Portuguese are actually predicted to have really high overlap over most of the range of the entire Portuguese species. And this is based on you know, the favorability of both species in each area. But if you look at something like a SNP, I mean a, a structure plot, you see that, again, these are, uh, each of these columns is now an individual, and the colors are the proportion of the genome that is uh, assigned to one group or another. The Mediterranean and the Portuguese field goal have no sign of any kind of introgression or, um, or gene flow between them. And we didn't sample all the way to the contact zone between the two, but uh, there's been a follow-up study using a smaller amount of markers, and they have never found any uh, hybrids of, between these two perfect species. So it seems like there's, there's reproductive isolation in this group. Um, and so why does this matter for, uh, say, conservation? So this, we took these niche models and we projected them in the future using different climate change scenarios. This is one looking at 2080 and where these different species are predicted to be. And so like a lot of species, the short-tailed field bull is predicted to move north. Uh, the Mediterranean field bull actually tracks uh, altitude. It's going to move up in altitude along a lot of mountain ranges in, in uh, Europe. But the Portuguese field bull actually doesn't have very, very many places it can go. So it's getting smaller, smaller range in that um, little corner of the Iberian Peninsula. And I should point out there's no field goals on, uh, uh, Portuguese field goals on the Ireland, but they can maybe live there in the future. <laughs> um, <laughs> also, if we look at something, uh, inbreeding coefficient, which is the uh, uh, genomic measure of how, how, how much they're mating with uh, closely related individuals. Um, and I've separated out now some, some island populations of the short tail field bowl, which are predicted to have higher inbreeding. And what you can see is that the, the Portuguese field bowl uh, has uh, consistently higher inbreeding coefficients than the other two. 
So there may be some, uh, it may be a, a species that we want to kind of watch and make sure and see if there's, um, it's a conservation concern. Um, and actually what's interesting is that, you know, this is an area of really high endem endemicity. Uh, there's a lot of endemic species in that area. Um, and it's actually not the first endemic microbus bowl in that area, which is pretty well. Um, so uh, a recent public, uh, study just got published uh, looking at Microbus californicus, which is the California bowl. Um, and this is a single species, currently recognized as a single species through California in its range. But they found really, really distinct uh, genetic groups within uh, this uh, species and no obvious signature of admixture between them. So that it seems like reproductive isolation. And also, um, these, these two populations split about 50,000 years ago, also due to uh, glacial cycling. So it seems to be a kind of common phenomenon uh, in, in Macros. Also, there's no obvious geographic barrier here in California where they contact each other. So it's pretty interesting. But again, they're, they're considered one species. So, what, what is actually driving this uh, differentiation between these groups? So one of the things I think might, have, might play a role is uh, differentiation, at least, the, the fixation of a bunch of different SNPs across the genome may be promoted by this population cycling. Because if you think about it, we have basically a population bottleneck every four years, and if these things are isolated, they're gonna be fixing different mutations in different populations every four years. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little more in a Little bit. There's actually an interesting idea about heterochromatin repeats. So heterochromatin repeats are these uh, repeat regions in, in genomes that typically around the centromere and telomeres, they're, they're parts of the genome that don't actually encode for anything um, and are tightly packed. And the, the, these sex chromosomes in these giant sex chromosomes in these field holes are actually filled with heterochromatin repeats. That's actually what the majority of these sex chromosomes are. And there's a model where if there are a different number of repeats in different uh, populations, then when they come back into contact, they have trouble <coughs> crossing over. And uh, it could lead to reproductive isolation. So that's pure speculation. But really, I think there's just other pre- and or post-psychotic barriers to gene flow that are driving uh, isolation in this group. We just don't know enough about them and what matters to them. So for, for instance, pheromones are really important in bulls urinary proteins, these voles might look completely different to each other, um, but we just think they look similar. Um, or there could be something else like seminal fluid proteins that don't allow for fertilization to occur, which is important in other rodent groups. So we still don't know. Okay, so looking, kind of exploring this data, I looked uh, at this data within the, the just the short-tailed field world at northern species. And, um, this is, again, looking at this 35,000 SNPs, the same exact data set. Um, and looking at a PCA plot, it really separates out um, these different populations and basically separate the, separates them out by geography. And so I have them color-coded by, by country in this case. And if you kind of squint and uh, flip the PC axes, you can see that it basically, the, the PC uh, plot basically matches the <coughs> geography of these holes. So there's strong geographic structuring in genetics of these bulls. And so I wanted to explore that within one species, since um, we get really strong divergence in about 30,000 years between these different species, what happens within one? And to, to look at that, I looked at a phenomenon, uh, a pattern called the, the Celtic fringe of rhythm. And so what the Celtic fringe is, it's not a funky hairstyle or anything like that, uh, it uh, describes a pattern of uh, cultural, linguistic, and actually genetic variation of humans in, in, on the British Isles, where uh, these red-haired Celtic people typically live on the kind of coastal, northern, and peripheral populations of Britain. And this was caused uh, in part by a partial <coughs> replacement and displacement by Anglo-Saxons who colonized the British Isles after the Celts, okay, and kind of pushed them to the periphery. And the reason why this is relevant in any way to what I'm talking about <laughs> is that this pattern has actually been found in a lot of different species of animals in Britain as well. 
So this is uh, uh, one example from a water bowl, completely different bowl, but um, they, so in the water bowl, if you look at mitochondrial uh, genes, there is a northern uh, haplogroup and a southern haplogroup that are quite diverse from one another. And this is repeated across many, many different species. This is looking at a bunch of small mammals and a snail, and across different markers and uh, different species, we say a similar pattern. There's a kind of northern or, or peripheral group, haplogroup or genetic group um, population, and a kind of core southern and middle uh, genetic group, which would be in the red in this case. And uh, what I think what the, the mechanism for how this is formed uh, is due to the dual colonization of the British Isles. So um, about 20,000 years ago, right after the last glacial maximum, as ice sheets retreated and uh, habitat became favorable for temperate species in the UK, there was a land bridge between the UK and continental Europe. And there was a colonization by a group of uh, organisms uh, shortly after the uh, last glacial maximum. And so that represents kind of the first wave of colonization. And about uh, 10,000 years after that, there was another cold snap um, and uh, partial formation of ice sheets again, which caused sea levels to, to uh, go down. And then another formation of this land bridge between continental Europe and the UK. And what we got was a second wave of colonization by many species. And they came into contact and partially replaced or intergressed with uh, the original founding population. So that's how they think the, the Celtic fringe is formed and how, why it's been formed for so many different species. And so this has been well studied in a couple groups, but one is the, the bait bowl. Um, lots of bowls in Britain, lots of bowls just in general. Um, and so if you look at something like uh, mitochondrial uh, genes, you can see they have this kind of classic Celtic fringe with this northern population and uh, some coastal southern population. And if you compare them to other uh, bowls in Europe that are all white, you can see that they come from independent groups within Europe, so these represent two colonizations. And this is also mirrored in their, um, if you look at uh, a protein, a hemoglobin protein, or uh, SNP data, genome-wide SNP data. Okay, so they also have this pattern. And, but it's not just a kind of, quote unquote, neutral variation uh, that uh, is affected by this pattern. There's actually some adaptive significance as well. So what we have here are different mutations within hemoglobin. Um, and in the black, these are mutations that occur in the northern population, and white are the southern. What you can see is that there's a, uh, a certain mutation that causes a serine assisting change in hemoglobin that is adaptively intergressed into the southern population from the north. And they think that has adaptive significance because when you look, when you take these proteins that are formed by each of these different mutations and you do an assay to measure oxidative stress, the, the, black, the ones with the, the northern protein actually resist oxidation um, compared to the, the southern one. So what we have on the y-axis is a measure of, oxidative, of oxidation, and on the x is time. And so proteins that have that, uh, that uh, northern uh, mutation actually resist oxidation uh, compared to the, ones with, uh, the southern one. And so what they think the kind of adaptive story in that case is that these, the northern population uh, survived this cold snap on the British Isles and had, uh, there was some sort of selection for uh, metabolic efficiency, and so and that shows up in their, in their hemoglobin genes. And so the field bowl also has a pattern of uh, a Celtic bridge pattern, genetic variation. And when you look at uh, mitochondrial DNA, mycromosome markers, and microsatellites, which Jerry, who's on the computer somewhere, uh, listening right now, uh, this is from a study of his uh, blog book about uh, this, game, this year. You see differential patterns of introgression uh, between mitochondrial DNA, uh, bichromosome uh, uh, DNA, and microsatellite markers. And so what I wanted to know was uh, what are the demographic and selective processes that kind of drive the patterns in the field? Uh, okay. And so, take another break here. And 
And so what we did is we set up a study. Uh, we uh, sampled 124 uh, field holes across your, uh, Britain, the British Isles, uh, in 11 different populations. And we tried to get sampling basically north-south across the entire range of, of Britain. And right here is the kind of contact zone that we already knew about between mitochondrial groups. And so these are all the different populations. Um, I'm going to refer to them as populations 1 through 11, because as Jeremy pointed out, it's hard to pronounce these things. <laughs> we have fun little Lord of the Rings brings names. <laughs> but uh, uh, so I will just refer to them as populations 1 through 11, and they'll be color-coded, you know, dark blue to red uh, from north to south. And so what we did is we, we sampled 124 individuals in these 11 populations, and we did low coverage whole genome sequencing of all these individuals with a target of about 1x coverage per individual. We'll talk about this a little bit more. We mapped these again to this prairie bull genome, that was the best published genome. And then we also get mitochondrial sequences that we mapped to a published uh, field bull uh, mitochondrial genome. And before I go on, I have to thank uh, Nicholas McFerry, Fraser, and Nicholas Lowe, who uh, helped me a lot with this project. Um, it was only Nick's allowed on this project. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. And so without that, I've uh, a lot of the data that I have today. Um, so for low coverage whole genome sequencing, um, it's a lot, if you think about genomics a lot, it's a lot like pool seek. We pool a lot of individuals together and. Uh, from a single population, you can get allele frequencies uh, in that population. But the difference is you actually retain individual identities, and so you can get individual genotypes. Um, and, but because you have such low coverage, not all individuals will have coverage at every single site. And so what you actually do is you impute genotypes uh, for individuals that don't have coverage. And each of the times you do that, you get uh, both the genotype and a likelihood score that's associated with it. And what's nice about that is you can then perpetuate the likelihood score throughout so that you can uh, weight each of your genotypes based on how likely they are. And the likelihood score, you can um, imagine population here and population B where there is a, a single SNP, a single mutation that's shared amongst all, almost all the individuals that you have sampling for. So if you don't have coverage of that at a certain individual, you would impute that, that, that the individual had that A genotype there, and then you might have a, a fairly high likelihood score because the rest of the population has that. And you can contrast that to something like here where there's a lot of variation in whether they have, if they're heterozygous or homozygous. And so if you impute the genotype of an individual there, you might have a lower likelihood score, and that would be perpetuated. And what's nice about this method is you don't only get population level <coughs> measures of allele frequencies, but you can actually, um, uh, have the individual genotypes, which can be used for something like calculating the individual atmosphere scores or something like that. But again, weighted by the likelihood um, of that genotype. And so this is kind of a flow chart of what we did. Uh, we had 124 individual field goals with uh, and did low coverage whole genome library prep and sequencing, mapped to the reference genome for the nuclear data, and ended up getting about one X, or looking to get one X coverage and um, we've got a lot of SNP data. And from that, we get individual genotype you know, likelihoods and, uh, and population level real frequencies. Um, and we could also map um, to the uh, uh, published microsegressus field goal mitochondrial genome. And you end up with much, much higher coverage of the mitochondrial genome because there's many, many more copies of mitochondrial genomes in each of our cells than, than nuclear genomes. And so you get very high coverage of the mitochondrial genome across basically the Thing. We, and then we can use those data for population genetic analysis. And so the results from the study, we got about 5.8 million uh, SNPs uh, distributed across the whole genome of these bulbs. Um, and we ended up with about an average of 0.77x coverage. Uh, mm -hmm. The genome was not quite one, but it was pretty good considering we had a diverged reference genome. Uh, we ended up with a 15,000 800 uh, base pair of mitochondrial genome data set with an average of about 70x coverage. So very high coverage in, of the mitochondrial genome. Um, and we, but we had to drop five individuals that didn't pop past quality control filtering in that, uh, those steps. And so what we find if we can look at it, what, we can look at the distribution of genotypes uh, using a PC analysis, 
And what you see is a PC1 separates out, again, the, the northern and southern uh, genotypes. So there's a, a north-south uh, uh, distribution uh, on PC1. And this uh, PC2 seems to separate out the middle genotypes that probably represent admixed individuals. So we'll look at that a little, um, a little bit as well. And if you look at mitochondrial structure, um, so we, again, we have a structure plot. Each of the rows is an individual and the population they're assigned to. And you can see that the, you know, the <coughs> mitochondrial genome, the transition is about where it was for single genes in the mitochondria. And in this haplotype network, each of these uh, uh, circles is, a, 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 is a, a different haplotype. And they're scaled to the size of how many individuals um, have that haplotype, that individual haplotype. And the lines, the, the branches connecting them are scaled relative to the number of mutational differences between them. And so what you should notice is that there's a, a large separation between the, this northern, more northern uh, haplotype group and southern haplotype group. And also this northern haplotype group just has more diversity in general. And it might be because it represents an older colonized form. Um, and we can compare this to what we find in our nuclear data. So this is uh, uh, using a program called NGS Admix, which which looks uh, which works a lot like structure, assigning individuals to different populations. But this time, using the, the nuclear data, and you can see there is a distinct southern and distinct northern uh, genetic population group. But there's a more kind of admixture and a kind of patchy mosaic of uh, admixture between these different groups. And we confirm this with other uh, kind of population structure uh, analyses, including PC angst. And basically when you increase the number of populations to assign to, you can just see that there's, there's tons of population structure within this, uh, uh, within this data. And I think you know, if, you, uh, um, if you allowed it to look for uh, more and more populations, you would basically find populations at every location that we sample from. So there's just a lot of structure. So we found a, a signature of mitonuclear discordance. Um, so where the, the nuclear genome is able to ingress a lot farther north than the, the mitochondrial genome. Um, and uh, this can be partially explained by uh, just simple patterns of colonization. Um, so when uh, voles, the females are phylopatric, which means that they stay in a single territory. So there's male bias dispersal in these groups. And they've shown in, in uh, a lot of rodent species that have this kind of uh, 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 dispersal pattern, that if you have an original colonizing uh, group, the females are actually resistant to invaders coming into their territory. And so the males are the ones that will be uh, uh, moving onwards and, 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 and uh, dispersing to new populations. And so the reason why this is relevant is that we have a signature of the original um, mitochondrial lineage, which is a maternally inherited of the original um, colonizing group that is much farther south than the, the uh, and perhaps resistant um, than the nuclear data. If you look at pairwise FST across the genome, it's uh, pretty high across um, the whole genome. And again, so we're looking at uh, each individual slip, SNP, so there's a, about 5.8 million SNPs on this graph. And what you can see is that there's a high divergence across the entire genome. This blue line is the average. And we can zoom in on this a little bit. And so this is looking at our northernmost and southernmost populations. Um, and so overall, we get a high uh, uh, pairwise average FST of 0.138. Um, and you can see it's pretty evenly distributed across the entire genome. Um, there's a little bit of wonkiness right here, which initially caught the eye. but this is, has to do with actually mapping to the reference genome. Uh, there's just less SNPs there, so it gets a little weird. Um, but there's no obvious you know, peaks of uh, FST that would uh, indicate either uh, restricted aggression or selection or um, reduced uh, recombination or something like that. Um, and it's interesting to compare this to other systems. So uh, Nicholas let me steal some of his unpublished data, which was uh, which was generated in a very similar way. And the two things should pop out 
right away. One is if you look at the, the blue line, which is the average across the genome. It's, of course, much, much lower looking at these pairs of populations of, of uh, uh, cod. And this is because there's a lot more gene flow between them, which is homogenizing the genome of these uh, species and um, uh, of these populations. Also, you should see that there's uh, these uh, little peaks of uh, FST. And in this case, this group represents inversions. So these are areas of the genome that are resistant to, uh, uh, to uh, integration between one group or another. <laughs> And finally, should the, they, they, we have about the exact same dense density of SNPs across the genome. So there's not less SNPs in the COD case. It's just that there's less SNPs that are around this high FST area. And they're all, all you know, millions of SNPs that they have are all at very low FST because there's a lot more gene flow. And our highest FST is actually between this Easter Ross uh, population and the southernmost population. And again, it's very high FST across the entire genome. So we looked also at populations that are closer to each other in this kind of zone of admixture where, they, where their populations are mixing. Um, and of course, the, the, the pairwise FST is much lower, um, but there isn't a, you know, any signal of, of peaks or anything else like that in the, in the data. So I, I was originally interested in trying to figure out if we can see if there's any uh, uh, evidence for restricted uh, gene flow in this population. So I use a program called EAMS, which estimates uh, uh, effective migration between different populations using a uh, pairwise FST matrix. Um, and so, and, and uh, looks for areas where there's restrictions or an, uh, an increased effective migration. And we found uh, three areas that had uh, significant uh, restricted of effective migration, one around that, that second population up in the north, uh, one intriguingly between the, the uh, right around the area where the, the mitochondrial lineages um, uh, uh, meet each other, and one in the south there. But really these, even though they were significant, they don't represent all that much uh, of a reduction in uh, gene flow. So this is the, a log uh, my effective migration rate, so if you had a log negative one color here, that would mean it was a 10 times reduction of, 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 of effective migration. And so even though it's significant, it's just a slight reduction of, of, of migration between these, or gene flow between these populations. And overall, what we get is a signal, a really, really strong signal of isolation by distance. And so this is, we use Mantel tests and linear model to try to look at the association between genetic distance and geographic distance. And there's a really strong uh, signal of that. So basically, the farther away the poles are, the more genetically uh, distant they are. Finally, I was really interested in trying to find areas of the genome that might be under selection in these poles um, because of there could be adaptive regression or other things that uh, could be uh, interesting. So we, I used a program called PC Tanks, which identifies PC variants that are significantly divergent compared to the null distribution of genetic drift in our data. And maybe unsurprisingly, given the way that the, the method is uh, calculated, this is our uh, von Brony corrected uh, significance threshold. There, is no, there are no parts of the genome that show any significant uh, signatures of selection. And you know, it's probably because uh, the signature is overwhelmed by this really strong signature of genetic drift in our data. And so again, it's good to compare to other more normal data, maybe, and uh, uh, and so again, I stole some data from from Nicholas, and what you can see is that uh, you know in these in these populations, you not only get uh, a strong signature rate right at inversion, which uh, shows differentiation between these populations, but also you get uh, signatures of individual loci that may be under uh, adaptive selection between in these groups, but we don't find that because we have overwhelmingly strong uh, drift. Okay, so what we found in the pelvic fringe is that the isolated populations that form the pelvic fringe are really highly diverged. Um, again, this is in about 10,000 years of, of, of uh, divergence in this group. Um, there's minor nuclear discordance in this data, but it's probably driven by uh, sex bias dispersal. Um, overall, overall we, we have a really strong uh, signature of isolation by distance. And there are no obvious uh, genomic regions of, with res either restricted intergression or uh, that look like they're under 
selection. Okay, so what, what we found basically over all the bowls is there's a really strong signature of drift, no matter how we look at the genomes of these bowls. And I'm really interested in what actually drives these strong patterns of drift in these field bowls. And the thing that's kind of obvious that um, jumps out to me is the, the population cycling in these bowls. And so uh, this, is, uh, the, this population cycling is from a really well-studied group in the Kielder Forest, which is located here in Britain. And as I said before, the uh, population cycling varies by latitude, but similar, similar uh, at least in the length, between uh, populations that are around the same latitude. Um, but it's hard to study the effects of population cycling uh, on drift in populations that are connected, because if you get any kind of migration between them, uh, then that will kind of erase that, that signature. And so one of the uh, ways I want to address it and uh, have some preliminary data as kind of a bonus uh, project from my, from my PhD, and I'm just getting data from, is that actually to look at uh, isolated island populations. Because if these uh, island populations cycle, like they do on the mainland, as they are expected to, you might be able to get uh, signatures of the um, of drift quicker. And also you can use uh, modeling to see if these islands actually uh, have higher drift um, because of population cycling than you would expect rather than just being isolated alone. So you can create population models that look at that. So what I have is uh, nine different islands uh, populations. Uh, about 10 to 20 individuals per population, 134 total. And in my kind of preliminary analysis, kind of permissive uh, filtering, we get about 45,000 SNPs. And what's cool about these islands is they range in a bunch of different things, but uh, one of them is in the size of the island. So for example, this is PL Island, which is tiny. This is the whole extent, but we have population level samples from that island. And we can compare that to the largest island, which is about 1,600 square kilometers up there in the sky. And preliminary uh, results, uh, first off, show that the main, so we can look at uh, nucleotide diversity, which we measure genetic diversity in groups. Um, but the uh, mainland populations have uh, the highest genetic diversity, as you'd expect. But there isn't um, uh, an obvious, for instance, uh, signature of island size in relation to um, um, uh, genetic diversity. So here's PL Island and Sky Island our smallest and our largest, and they have similar levels of, of genetic diversity. And we actually have the lowest genetic diversity in these unpronounceable islands in the north, uh, north and southeast, and uh, they, uh, which, which makes sense in this case because these are, uh, have been shown to be uh, founded by populations that were brought over by humans uh, not very long ago, and so probably a really, really small founding population. And we, we've also looked, uh, you know, generally figured out pairwise FST values, and this is looking at pairwise FST to the closest mainland population. Um, and what's really interesting so far is that we're already getting pairwise FST in some of these populations that are at the same kind of scale as what we see on the mainland, even though this is only uh, after about uh, a, a, a thousand to six thousand years of divergence in this group. So I'm really interested to, to kind of dive into this data and figure it out, try to figure out the dynamics that are driving um, isolation in these groups. Um, so overall, we, we've shown that field goals show rapid genome-wide divergence, and it's probably uh, it's driven by isolation during population cycling. Um, these, the genomic divergence is reflected in their different environmental niches, but there is uh, actually more overlap predicted in the environmental niches than uh, the genetics show. We also found that the isolated populations that form the Celtic fringe are really highly diverged, even though they have only been isolated for 10,000 years. Um, and that uh, we are looking into how population cycling might be driving these patterns. And uh, so with that, uh, I want to acknowledge some people. First, uh, not people, organizations, uh, that funded a lot of my work, because uh, without all this funding, I couldn't have done all this stuff. Um, I want to acknowledge co-authors, people that are uh, co-authors on some of these uh, uh, projects, the Hair Lab members who have taken me in early on in my PhD and helped me with a lot of things, uh, members of the Serial Lab, the roving 
cast of people that come in and out of the SEAL lab over the years. Uh, a lot of undergraduate research assistants and teaching assistants that have helped me. Um, I want to, I've taught a lot, I've taught seven different courses and 10 different semesters while I was here, so there are a lot of people that help me with teaching over this time. And then, of course, the staff that helps uh, run everything. I especially want to point out John Howell, because he is a Renaissance man, not only a judge and the building manager, but also a poet. So this is one of the poems that John sent me about um, during my time here. Uh, and this is how he structured it, too. I ended the graphic, but uh, I just think it helps it out. But um, he's really bad. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, a whole collection of them I've gotten. Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, <laughs> uh, on top of that, um, so I, I wanted to put all the people that are helping with research, but there's just so many people I couldn't even do it. So I'll start with uh, Jeremy. Jeremy's been just an amazing advisor. He's such a kind and thoughtful person that has helped me with so many things and always cares about us and our students. And I can't, you know, say that, you know, enough for how much that, that's meant to me, just having someone that cared so much. Um, here we go. Uh, and the rest of the committee as well, Matt, uh, like I said, took me on very early. Uh, I did a rotation project, um, a two-month rotation project that is continuing for six years. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, and he, he, hasn't kicked, he hasn't kicked me out yet, but he's been a, a huge help for so many of the things I've done. Um, Jer Jerry, who's uh, on the here, hopefully listening to this whole thing, um, and in the UK, he's not only the the expert on these bowls, especially in Britain, uh, but he, uh, you know, he's always been a, a cheerleader of my work. And the other person in the world that I think that cares as much as I do about these bowls, and maybe <laughs> more, I don't know. Um, and visiting him in Scotland was amazing. Uh, and, and Nina, who has helped me, especially in the late end, the end of my PhD, with so much of the genomic work that I've done. That the last project, there's no way I could have done it without Nina. And she's been just so helpful. And, and awesome. Um, I also want to acknowledge Rick. Um, he you know, passed away halfway through the PhD, but as all of you who know him know that he was, you know, even the one hour conversation with Rick uh, can, can completely change the trajectory of your, your whole research. And um, so, yeah, so he's amazing. This is where I'm going to go. I'm, I'm going to uh, <laughs> um, so I, I also want to thank all of the amazing friends, postdocs, grad students, everyone that at Cornell, we've done a lot of fun things together. And uh, yeah, I, these are just, you know, there's a million more people that I should have on, up there, but these are just the ones that I can frankly find on Facebook in the last uh, few hours. But, um, but <laughs> group pictures, but it's a, like an amazing group of people um, here at Cornell. And all these people, like I said, I, I couldn't put together all the people that have helped me with research, but you know, all these people that I also, you know, wore silly costumes with, and um, those were all the people that also helped me with everything else uh, as well, so that's been great. Um, I also want to thank my family and my now extended family with the Tracys, um, who have been supporting me, you know, strangling snakes since I was a really kid, <laughs> little kid. Um, so my siblings that aren't here right now, but uh, they've always supported me in all the weird things that I've done over my life. Um, restrictions, uh, for better or worse, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I really can't think of them enough. Um, and I especially want to highlight my parents. So like I said, they, they encouraged uh, my weirdness from an early age, uh, and even threw me, this is pretty close to a bunch of sea lions. Right <laughs> you know, they, they are the, the reason and the, why I, I, I do what I do and um, why I've been able to do what I do, and they support me in every way. They are terrible at ice skating, but uh, <laughs> they're really great people. And, uh, uh, and yeah, and even even to this day, I'm throwing, giving my mom snakes that I found, and she's a big good sport about it. So I appreciate that. And then, uh, yeah, finally, want to thank Allison, uh, who also um, deals with my the snakes. <laughs> it's been pretty amazing to meet someone and then marry someone uh, from a graduate program and it's been able to support me this whole way. And I really love our uh, our growing little family here, um, uh, which has been 
great, and uh, we've gone through lots of ventures, and it's been awesome. And don't forget to look at this. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> always been sassy, so that's uh, So, uh, yeah, with that, uh, thank you everyone for coming, and uh, I'll take any questions. <laughs>
this is such a widespread, ubiquitous, and seemingly robust you know, organism across such a huge range. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that there's something about the organism itself that allows it to occupy all these you know, wide environments without necessarily needing to respond to selection? And that could also be? I don't know if I would go that far to say that. I think, yeah. I don't know. I, yeah, I don't. I don't. I haven't heard of anything like that. Obviously, the the vole kind of phenotype works really well. I mean, they're spread all over the place. There's a lot of the different species. They all do really well. They they look boring, but man, it works. And uh, and part of this is part of this is due to the kind of like live fast die young dynamics that they have. They get they get eaten a lot, um, and, but they they can just expand in population really quickly. It's really interesting well there's a whole field of literature trying to figure out what drives the cycles um, and there's a, you know a lot of the classic things kind of influence it, predators and um, resources and things like that but it's different actually in different populations but it seems to be a signal so I think they are under strong selection there's a lot of them you eat all the time and things like that but um, they just they have their in a good spot right now but, but they but they're yeah, Liam? Uh, the population cycling is really interesting mm -hmm. um, I'm curious to know if you have any data as to what might be causing. I mean, you know, probably like there's some environmental component, right, with the latitudinal gradient, but also have you been able to track like maybe like inbreeding depression throughout the cycles, or is each one of these cycles like a different selection event? What do you think what's going on? Other people have done temporal sampling, not of these holes, but different holes, and tracked inbreeding depression over time. And basically what ends up happening is that there's just a little bit, at least a little bit of migration from other populations and so not all populations are in sync cycling for one there's kind of density dependent uh, migration from one population to another in, in the meta population and even if you get just one individual coming in it kind of rescues the population pretty quickly um, because you're you wouldn't expect the same um, mutations to get fixed in one population versus the other and you actually get this weird counterintuitive increase in heterozygosity when there's population cycling, if there's at least a little bit of migration, because individual populations, the homozygosity goes up, so they, they lose genetic variation, but because it's alternative SNPs that are getting uh, fixed, when they actually, for, uh, you know, when you have a little bit of migration, you end up with a kind of, uh, you, you end up with heterozygosity over a lot of the genome uh, right after that migration. And so that's why I wanted to look at the islands, is because it's such, it's so complicated when you have even just a little bit of migration, I want to see if maybe we can find populations that are isolated enough to try to um, tease out these dynamics. Um, yeah. So I'm so fascinated by bull diversity. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned that there are lots of congeners in the mm -hmm. uh, Are there any, uh, any species co-occurring differentially across your... So the other bulls, they're, they're actually not congeners. They're, they're different. They're bulls in different uh, uh, genera. Um, so, like the water bull, you know, it's in the same family, but the but the water bull is like double the size and lives on, in rivers, and it's basically like our muskrats. Um, so that's what water, water bulls are. They basically the way they so when I, I trapped bulls in, in Sweden, and there are multiple species of bulls there too. All microtus. Um, microtus and other ones as well. And what what happens is that you know if I trap in an open field. Um, I get only uh, field levels. And, but if I moved you know, 20 <coughs> yards into the, the forest edge, I would get uh, bank bulls or other bulls that were, uh, um, that were there. So it seems to be really strong habitat partitioning. And then you know, the, the time that I got in uh, water bulls was because it was near a, a body of water. And so they have these, it's really strong partitioning between these different um, bull species. What I don't know is within these cryptic species, what exactly is the, you know, they have some, some ecological differentiation between them as measured by the environment and the modeling, but there's probably something else that they're specializing in that just hasn't been measured yet. I've always been struck by, you know, prairie and meadowballs co-occurring in the fields of Illinois. Right, right. And there's some sort of resources that they're probably it's using. Different. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, like, there's a, parts of Siberia that have 12 different species of shrews that uh, co-occur, which I think is so awesome. <laughs> and uh, and but they and they and they kind of you know range like this in size all twelve of them and they basically are like you know one of them's eating this type of grub and this tiny microhabitat and the other one's eating 
uh, you know, grasshoppers in this tiny little microhabitat, all within the kind of same area, and there's been able to be this kind of resource partitioning at this kind of really micro scale. So um, there could be something like that. Um, but yeah, it, yeah, yeah. I think we probably should draw it, but thank you so much.